Franz Hochstrasser. Today's guest is the founder and CEO of Raise Green, an investment crowdfunding portal for offerings that directly address climate change. Some of the offerings on the platform are inspiring. A member of the Obama administration's Paris climate team, he'll share insights about his work and his superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show. Franz, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Uh, I'm just giddy uh, with excitement to talk to you. Uh, So thank you for making time. Absolutely, Devin. It's my pleasure. Uh, Been a fan of your work here for a bit and excited to make the connection and come on the show. Well, thank you. And we're excited to have you at Supercrowd 22 as well. Uh, You sort of epitomize what I think Supercrowd 22 is about, what really in so many ways I'm about. Uh, climate change is a huge problem. Uh, some would argue, and I think I'm I'm at least close to this camp, if not in it, that, that climate change is the biggest threat the world faces today. Uh, and we have to deal with it. Millions and millions and millions, maybe billions of lives are uh, at risk. Certainly lifestyles of billions of people are at risk. So this is important stuff. And, and what you're doing at Raise Green addresses this in such a positive, proactive way. I just, I just love it. Why don't you take a minute and tell people about Raise Green? Yeah. Uh, I, well, first of all, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, the climate crisis is honestly the most pressing issue, I think, facing humanity. Um, and it has been for a number of years, uh, but more and more people are also uh waking up to that fact, you know, when runways are melting in the UK and we have, um, you know, hundred, a hundred million Americans exposed to extreme heat just in the last couple of days. Uh, and the president goes to the podium and says, you know, that this is an emergency, uh, you know, that, that means something and 195 million Americans now, uh, are alarmed or concerned about the climate crisis, according to the Yale Program on Climate Change Communications. So this anxiety that uh, we're all starting to surface collectively um, as as humans uh, is shared and it's it's broad. And so for those that are overwhelmed by this challenge of a global uh, climate crisis and and that are tired of being told that they can recycle or petition their way out of this problem, and they're tired of waiting for uh, companies and politicians to take action, Raise Green is the community financing platform that enables every American to join the ranks of heroic climate entrepreneurs and innovators that are powering that transition from dirty to clean energy. So we make it possible for uh, all Americans to invest uh, with Raise Green uh, and really join those that are actually making a difference, uh, reclaim the ownership of the energy system and put their money to work uh, to make the world a better place and uh, can also make a, re- a return while they do it. Uh, so we're a funding platform that enables that process and uh, we're just thrilled to share that opportunity um, with the world. Well, uh, having made uh, an investment on your platform and having looked at many, uh, it really is kind of exciting to see what's going on because there's a really, uh, a, a diverse range of opportunities on the platform. You have, uh, some debt financing kind of instruments, some of which like, uh, you've got a bank involved, right? So the, the, the some very low interest rates, that I associate with the word bank, uh, you, know, you know, not me, for, not me to judge or advertise, but you know, it seems like really a low risk kind of deal. Uh, and the money's all being used to make, uh, you know, home improvements that would reduce carbon emissions. So it's, it's kind of like perfect in so many ways. And then you also have deals that are like risky, high tech, green things. So, uh, how do you sort of curate this uh, collection of deals? Um, great question. So when we started the company back uh, in, in 2018, uh, we very much so wanted to make the process of creating 
and funding and then building and running solar projects specifically a lot easier. Um, and so we set out to do that, you know, to empower individuals to create their own green job. And uh, what we found is that uh, you know, developers of, of solar projects uh, go through the solar coaster, which means that they've got uh, at any given time uh, either a great set of choices for financing or a really bad set of choices. Um, and depending on the size of project they're developing, um, it's, it's even more challenging. Um, and so we focus on mid-size solar projects between about 50 kilowatts and five megawatts. And from the outset, um, that focus, you know, was like our, like the way Amazon focused on books in the 1990s. Uh, cause if we could figure out how to finance those projects, we could do it with other types of distributed energy resources and, and even climate startups. Um, and, and, what we found is that we got a bunch of incoming from those other types of developers, energy efficiency, uh, electric vehicle charging, um, and even as you say, you, you know, green banks. Um, and so, as as you mentioned, you know, we have we have an offering on the marketplace now that has uh, that's that's a, done by a green bank and is a certified green bond offering. Um, and and then we also have climate tech startups that are. Um, you know, just getting started with with an idea um, and a pitch deck, and uh, perhaps you know a, a patented or you know groundbreaking technology that will reduce emissions uh, and make climate uh, make communities more resilient to climate change. So we love that we're able to offer the flexibility of uh, having those options for non accredited, accredited, and institutional investors alike. Um, so that they can make a determination about how they want to put their money uh, into the new climate economy. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love is it seems to me that you've created a, a culture that uh, values the small investors, the really small investors. A lot of the deals, I, I couldn't say all of them, maybe you could tell me, but a lot of them had a $100 minimum investment uh, requirement, which is pretty modest. Um, it's not unusual, uh, but the, it did seem to be the preponderance of your deals. And that is kind of unusual, even in crowdfunding. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've been we've been intentional about uh, and, and doing our best to keep the minimums as low as possible. Um, you know, when you when you think about addressing the climate crisis writ large, um, centering justice and access in that challenge um, really is is imperative if we're going to have a more equitable uh, world that that transitions to to low carbon solutions. So a big part of that is offering a, the opportunity for the 90 percent of Americans that are not accredited investors um, to get into that that type of investing uh, now as the as the technologies are taking off. So uh, we definitely encourage issuers to keep the minimums low. Um, as, for as little as $100, you can come in on most of the raises on Raise Green, uh, and we're intent on keeping it that way. Uh, but what we have also found is that um, our average investment size over time has actually gone up because the more retail investors that come in on deals, uh, the more attractive those deals become for the bigger investors uh, who are used to preferential terms, but they see, oh, well, there, there must be an opportunity here, and so they're they're starting to write bigger checks. Um, so it's all it's all working. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, you did a, a a project recently, and I, I I don't expect you to be an expert on every deal that's cleared on the platform. But you did a deal in Baltimore that really was kind of inspiring. It was a a neighborhood project where uh, there was a nonprofit sponsor. Uh, and I'm forgetting the name of the, the, the sponsor, but it was a nonprofit entity. And then the, the community had contributed space on the local school to put solar panels, but the power wasn't going to be used in the school. It was sold to people in the neighborhood who had homes where they couldn't traditionally afford to put solar panels on them, relatively modest income community. But uh, now you gave them the option to basically swap their power provider so they could get power from 
solar instead of power from the grid, or at least partially offset. Anyway, they, they, they end up saving money uh, right off the shoot. Day one, they just get cash, extra cash in their pockets, and they get uh, uh, solar panel, you know, uh, green energy. How does that work? I mean, it's, it's you know, the people putting this together, I mean, it's an impressive little deal. What do you know about it? Yeah, uh, this is actually sort of uh, what I feel is sort of the holy grail of, uh, of clean energy. And that is uh, that the, the folks who own the uh, uh, energy generating unit or the solar panels in this case can also be the ones buying the electricity. Um, so in essence, if you're able to balance that out, uh, you could have somebody paying themselves for their own electric bill. Uh, and that's a very beautiful, uh, you know, circular economy or circular economic uh, relationship. And this project you're referring to, uh, it gets about as close to that as I've ever seen. So uh, <laughs> this is uh, a, a project that uh, was led by a group called the Climate Access Fund. Um, they are a, a nonprofit in, in the Baltimore area, um, and they as you said, you know, they've worked with the Henderson Hopkins uh, High School, which is an East Baltimore inner city school um, to establish a community solar project on the rooftop of the school. And, and then to sell um, the subscriber aggregation or, or those that are buying the electricity um, to 100% low to moderate income off takers. Um, so folks that truly do need the discount on their electricity. Um, and then they're allowing people to invest in that project as well um, so that uh, in, in an accessible way um, so that they can have that opportunity to create a circular flow of uh, of electrons and uh, and cash flow. Um, and I, I can't endorse that project because I can't endorse any project on our marketplace or provide financial advice. But um, as you highlight, you know, it's a very exciting model. Yeah, it was it was great. Now, Franz, you're doing some really cool stuff, and uh, you're you're so young. I I didn't first appreciate that this wasn't something you did straight out of high school, and uh, <laughs> and, and you know, because obviously uh, you you could be an entrepreneur straight out of high school, but it turns out uh, you worked in the Obama administration and almost single-handedly negotiated the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, t tell us a little bit about <laughs> your experience in Paris the, at the, uh, what was it, COP21? Uh, uh, that was the Paris Accord and, then, uh, and your work in the Bi Obama administration. Sure. Well, Devin, uh, you, you're far too kind. I, uh, I am <laughs> well into my, my late 30s and um, I, I certainly didn't single-handedly <laughs> move the dial on uh, the Paris Agreement, but I, I was very proud to be a part of uh, all eight years of the Obama administration working on climate and energy issues. Uh, and um, it, was, it was an incredible honor. I, I often say I gave the government my 20s, uh, but I, I truly do not regret it. Uh, because it was it was so eye opening, and being in the room with uh, heads of state, you know, when they are uh, forced to make uh, concessions or assertions of their their red line positions, you know, as it relates to negotiations, um, was just eye poppingly fascinating and and uh, and wonderful. Um, and at the end of the day, as you say, you know, at COP twenty one. Uh, we did come away with uh, a truly inclusive, uh, ambitious, and and durable agreement, uh, which set, you know, 196 countries, all all of the countries of the world, on a trajectory toward lower emissions. Uh, when we went into that negotiation, um, the climate tracker uh, had us headed towards a 3.6 degrees C world. And when we came out uh, with that agreement uh, and the, the nationally determined contributions, we were on a trajectory to 2.7. Uh, so massive shift just in terms of ambition and where we're headed. Uh, and yet uh, <laughs> the, the challenge remains and you know, we, we need to continue to ratchet down emissions uh, 
increase the, the emission reduction ambition of nationally determined contributions from countries. But then the key, and this is why uh, I started Raise Green ultimately with, with a co-founder, uh, a couple co-founders, is that um, we, we actually have to implement all these solutions on the ground so quickly um, and, and faster than the pace of this problem happening um, that, that we really need all hands on deck uh, to hit those targets and then and then exceed them. So, uh, yeah, from from the halls of Paris, you know, to the to the the streets of of DC and and across the world, um, the nexus of action uh, really has shifted, um, and we all have an opportunity to be a part of that. It, it, it seems to me, and I don't want to sound Pollyannish, uh, but but you put yourself in an interesting position to take, uh, to build a successful business because of the reality that many clean tech opportunities are truly, truly represent some sort of financial arbitrage, right? That solar panels and wind energy, for instance, represent cheaper forms of energy than coal or natural gas, right? So if it's cheaper, then the only question is how quickly can we trade out that infrastructure, which is a financing question, which is what you do. Um, <laughs> it seems to me this is a big opportunity. Is that how you see it? Yeah. I mean, honestly, investing in climate is the largest economic opportunity in, in human history, I think. Um, and the question that we ask is, you know, who gets to own that infrastructure and who gets to benefit from it? Um, historically, that has been, uh, you know, the wealthy and and uh, the large corporations, uh, private equity firms, and and venture capitalists um, that that get to see the upside of these types of market shifts. Um, and so much of what we're focused on is is not just the deployment challenge, which in in and of itself is immense, as you say, um, but is getting more and more economically attractive. You know. 15 years ago, coal was 50% of the U.S. Uh, energy mix. Today, it's 15%. Uh, and 15 years ago, uh, solar and wind and, and other renewables were, you know, less than 10%, and now they're over 20%. Uh, so they've more than doubled. But and 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 that trajectory is only going to continue ultimately. Uh, but can we get the ownership aspects of those? Uh, of those pieces of infrastructure, those puzzle pieces that make up, you know, the the electrical grid as well as um, the rest of you know our energy and and uh, carbon emitting sources uh, to be uh, owned by by the community and by by everyone who wants to own a piece. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant model, Franz. I, I'm so thrilled to have you here. Uh, because of all you've accomplished and the potential you have to do so much more good in the world with Race Green. As you look back at all you've done, what, what do you see as your superpower? Uh, well, I, I love that you ask folks this on, on the show. And um, I, I had heard a couple of your episodes, so I anticipated you were going to ask me this. And I, I have to share that... Um, I used to uh, TA for a professor at Yale named uh, Zoe Chance, and she has written a book recently called Influence is Your Superpower. Uh, and so your, your show reminds me of, of her book as well as her, her, uh, her course. So if I asked her, she'd probably say influence. Um, <laughs> but and, and honestly, influence can and maybe should be everyone's superpower. You know, the, the importance of just asking for things that you want or that you feel, uh, you know, you uh, you should uh, be able to achieve, um, that's the best way to get them. Um, for me personally, I think it comes down to uh, to hard work, and that may sound, you know, cliche, uh, but uh, there was nothing special about <laughs> me coming out of you know undergrad and focusing on politics and linguistics. Um, that that got me a position on the Obama campaign back in 2008. 
uh, it, it really was just applying. And then when I, when you get an opportunity, uh, really just, you know, doing the very best that you can in the moment and as quickly as you can. Um, and so it, you know, I'm always reminded of some advice that my dad gave me, uh, and that my parents <laughs> repeated, uh, often and put into my, my high school yearbook um, as my kind of dedication, which was, uh, Franz, do what you know and don't be slow. Um, so <laughs> for me, it's really, you know, just do the work that has to get done. Uh, whatever's in front of you, do it as best as you can and, uh, and, and as quickly as you can. And, uh, and that becomes a superpower over time because you've done so much work. So... Yeah. You know, you, you talked about um, the work on the Obama campaign as an example. And having run for Congress, uh, I have a, an inkling of what a, a presidential campaign would be like, the work involved. It seems to me, from all I've read, that it is hard work on an order and scale of magnitude that is almost impossible to comprehend. Um, and so when you talk about hard work, it seems to me you come at this with a level of expertise uh, that is um, Im Im important for us to listen to. So uh, tell me, am I, am I right? Is it hard work working on a presidential campaign? <laughs> it's, it's immensely difficult, yes. Um, the hours themselves are uh, inhuman. Uh, so you know, you, you need to be in the office. Uh, well, it depends on what campaign you're working on, but generally, you know, before before nine, before before eight for most folks. Um, and then you start call time at five o'clock um, every night, all seven days a week uh, as an organizer. And so you're calling from five o'clock until uh, eight or nine o'clock at night um, in order to try to make at least a hundred calls a day um, to, recruit volunteers um, to uh, to persuade voters um, and to get more folks to support your candidate. So um, it's it's a and then all throughout the day, you're organizing canvases and events and talking to to voters um, on the doors, knocking doors. As you know, you know, having been a candidate yourself, it's immensely powerful to have a conversation with a voter straight, you know, uh, face to face. And that's probably the most persuasive thing you can do. So uh, that type of work uh, can be exhausting, uh, but it's it's truly exhilarating and, and so, so rewarding. Yeah, uh, it, it is an incredible uh, lesson. Uh, and it seems to me you've, you've let that carry over in your life. I mean, you can always look at that experience, look back and say, okay, th th there were, you know, this incredible workload back then. Okay, <laughs> I'm only working 80 hours this week. This is I'm coasting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how would you coach someone who hasn't done that level of work? I mean, everyone thinks they work hard. Uh, I tend to be skeptical of everyone who hasn't, you know, worked on a presidential campaign or been to the Olympics. Uh, <laughs> how do you coach someone? to actually work hard? Oof, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one, Devin. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I heard something actually just, just this morning about um, the, way that, uh, the way that a startup founder maybe should think about uh, really big tasks is, or, or important tasks. And that's to say uh, that, that, or that what they say, and I, not recalling where this came from exactly, but basically um, take any given task that you have and break it into a hundred smaller tasks. And, um, and that's how you, you can make perpetual progress. Um, and, and so I think, you know, atomistically or thinking at the, you know, at the moment to moment, um, what am I spending my time doing? Am I scrolling endlessly through Instagram stories and TikTok reels? Or am I, you know, reading about the people I'm going to meet the next day and learning uh, who they are and how uh, our paths can intersect most productively? Um, you know, th there are pockets of moments in life where you can 
uh, use the time like that you're sitting at the DMV in line or, uh, <laughs> you know, or, or on your way to, to work and listening to a podcast that inspires you um, where you can continually stay curious and, and engaged. And, and that is work as well. Uh, because you know that the mind uh, the mind works uh, around the clock if you let it. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of <laughs> the best coach ad- advice I could <laughs> give in the moment is, is just think about think about what what's next and and how you can prepare for it and execute yeah. against it. Well, Franz, we're we're thrilled to have you here today. I'm so grateful that you're going to join us for Super Crowd 22. Uh, I'm excited for that event, and I'm, I'm convinced that we're bringing together uh, some of the greatest minds in the industry and, frankly, some of the best people in the world, uh, people who have devoted their, their lives, as you have in so many ways, to fixing big problems. And it's an opportunity for us to come together and talk about how we can support you and how together we can help all kinds of people doing all kinds of things like putting solar panels on high schools in Baltimore for the benefit of the low income people in the neighborhood. I mean, it's changing the world. One solar panel, one home at a time. This is great stuff. Uh, so before we go, um, we take just a minute and tell people how they can learn more about Raise Green Take a minute, tell them how they can do a deal, how they can actually back a deal on Raise Green. If they're an entrepreneur, tell them how to learn more about raising money on Raise Green. And and then maybe tell people how they can follow you on social media or connect with you if you're open to an email or whatever. It's a lot, but give us give us a minute or two on how to do all that. Absolutely. So, uh, and Devin, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, give you a shout out for all that you've done, you know, your writings, uh, your your campaigns, as well as, uh, you know, the, the podcast and organizing Supercrowd, a place where Supercrowd 22, where people can come together and, and share these powerful stories. Um, so I'm just one of those stories and excited to, to be a part of, of the movement that you're building as well. Um, from, you know, if you want to get more involved um, in financing clean energy and the climate uh, transition, uh, you can go to invest.raisegreen.com. Uh, you can invest as little as $100, uh, which, you know, most of us uh, who are who are employed will make in a day. Um, it's it's a uh, it's should be an accessible amount of, of money for for most Americans to, to deploy. Um, but um, you know, you can also save up to that and uh, you can invest anywhere from $100 up to, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars if you have that kind of money. We have uh, projects across the country uh, from, you know, solar on an inner city Baltimore school to uh, energy efficiency projects, you know, on on the West Coast and all throughout the, the Midwest. Um, so, you know, check us out at raisegreen.com. Uh, if you are raising capital and you could use an extra hundred thousand dollars in thirty days, or another two hundred fifty thousand dollars in sixty days, or you want to raise up to five million dollars um, on our marketplace, uh, please uh, go on there. You can book a consultation for free. We'll give you all the advice we can about uh, how to prepare for a crowdfunding offering and how to uh, conduct one on our marketplace. And you can do an indication of interest uh, for a very small. Um, nominal fee. So uh, do check us out there. I'm at, um, we're at Raise Green Inc. Uh, on uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. My personal Twitter handle is at Franzish, F-R-A-N-Z-I-S-H. Um, and I'm always happy to, to entertain messages there or from uh, from LinkedIn. So I hope I covered everything you asked, Devin. But uh, <laughs> That's great. That's <laughs> it, was, great. it was a good question. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I appreciate you you being here, Franz. And uh, for the sake of all of us who live on this planet, uh, we wish you every success in uh, your efforts at Raise Green uh, to reverse climate change quickly. Uh, we, we need you to we need you to succeed. <laughs> well, likewise, Devin. Thanks for all you're doing to support uh, us and other amazing entrepreneurs for inclusive financing and, and crowd investing. So. Um, thank you so much. All righty. Let's do some good. 
Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show. Twice each week, we host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.